So we've been going along bit by bit on the different parts of basic project management in food product development and food science related tasks. And we have covered a lot of the different components of planning. We're now moving into the point of implementation of our plan. We haven't done the budget piece yet, and we haven't done the resource planning yet, but We've got to move ahead quickly here, and so we're going to jump into implementation. And many of you um, who are following along in the Niagara College Innovation class are actually at that implement state, implementation stage right now with your projects in Norm's class. And there are a lot of different considerations that you want to take into place, and so that's what we're going to cover off today. So we're at part six. At the end of this video, you will be able to use a variety of tools for monitoring and evaluating your project implementation. You'll revisit your Gantt chart as a means of tracking your process, and you'll describe the use of Scrum, Agile, and Kanban tools for project implementation and tracking the project progress of different food projects. So, again, uh, a lot of people have keep asking me, why are we doing all this project management stuff? We just know how to do this. Well, we keep talking about cycles of mastery in that you, uh, in the past, may have done some different projects. So, for example, in first year, when you had me for a nutrition class, we did a very basic product development project. That was your first cycle to mastery. And then the following year, you did a project with Keith Ellis, and that is a second cycle to mastery. Each time you do this cycling, you are gaining more skill set. And honestly, now we're at the point where when we're cycling in these uh, mastery cycles, we're laying on more levels of complexity. And I just had a great conversation with one of your colleagues. Um, and we were saying, you know what? The tools that we're using, such as Scrum and Agile and Kanban, they actually came from um, advanced manufacturing and uh, Scrum and Agile in particular came from software management. But these are tools that are universally used by product developers and not just food product developers, but people who are developing any number of products. So whether you're developing software or you're developing an app, you're developing a widget for a machine, if you are developing a service even, these tools are universally uh, recognized by product developers and as such you can overlay them into a wide variety of different manufacturing or product development scenarios and they'll be incredibly useful. At the same time too some of these tools are starting to overlap in the project engineering course. We are spending the front half of the course talking about project management and then we're spending the middle part of the course on to make processes, and so we're starting to transition topics and thinking about some of the tools that are used in operations management, not just not just from a project management. If you remember, the definition of a project is something that's discrete and unique as a start, beginning, or beginning, middle, and end. Pardon me. And we know that at the end of this project, the, the project is done, and people return back to their normal job roles. Operations management is where you're doing the routine stuff of every day. But some of the tools that we use for evaluating the effectiveness of projects and evaluating the effectiveness of operations are the same. When we talk about DMAIC, and we'll talk about that today, some of these tools start to overlap, and the measurements that we can be using for tracking our progress and tracking the success of our project is going to be the same as some of the tools that we're using to track the success of our operations. So we're at implementation. We have to cover budget and risk at a later point. The risk management and slide deck should be up on YouTube. Um, in the budget one, we will keep covering this. You have a whole course on financial management. So I don't want to overlap that, and I am not a financial manager, and um, I know my lane, and I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> So often in project management, there's an old school mindset, and that is focus on that completion of tasks with the endpoint as your ultimate completion. And software engineering really has changed that mindset. The idea of this, what's called a minimally viable product or a minimally viable concept is 
really the framework that software engineers came up with. The idea being get a minimally viable product into the hands of the stakeholders, get some feedback from them, make more improvements, and do a lot of this rapid feedback cycle, the plan, do, study, act, deming cycle. And there's another slide show just about the deming cycles. So look that one up. Um, but the idea being that in innovation, you need to be really, really nimble. And so you can't be waiting around for feedback. And especially you can't run this project start to finish with no feedback whatsoever, hand off a finished product to your stakeholder and say, ta-da, how do you like it? You need to have that feedback on a continuous basis throughout the entire product development cycle. Now, I'm not saying as a food product developer that you should launch a half-developed food product. What I'm saying is you should have a feedback loop that allows you to get constructive feedback from advisors, whether those are uh, managers within your company, whether they are people within your board of directors, people within uh, small focus groups. You want to get feedback on the viability of your concept and how successful it is so that you can move forward into um, later stage product development and know that you have a well-designed product. I keep harping on, I, I'm, I'm teaching a different course, the second year chemistry course, and the students were asking me, why do I need to freeze my product? Well, well does the customer get a product that is freshly made out of a kettle, or do they get a frozen product? Oh, okay. You really need to think about where does that feedback need to be taken, and what is the context of that feedback? And so another, another piece of the puzzle is who is giving that feedback? Do they have cognitive biases towards or against this product? If you take that product into the project manager who initially pitched the idea to you, they may have a bias saying, we need this product out there and, and I'm going to like it whether I like it or not. That quite often happens as compared to getting objective feedback. But the idea of these cycles of feedback in a rapid succession allows for refinement and that then allows for a more successful product rather than waiting till the very final bitter end for some of that feedback. Picking up on any ideas from Norm's class, well, Norm's class is very much built off of this minimally viable product feedback cycle. That's not an old school mindset that's based off of software engineering. Let's jump back into our Gantt chart here. You remember our Gantt chart from a different slideshow. And honestly, there are means within Gantt charts to be able to track progress. And if you remember, uh, this is actually a graphic. But I could go into my Gantt chart and I could adjust where I thought the progress was on a different task. That's a very, very opaque sort of measure. It's, it's very much just based off of my own judgment where I think things are. But honestly, it's how a lot of project groups run, where they go in and they say, did I do my site visit? Yep, it's done. Have I recreated the formulation? Well, I've done six different iterations. Maybe I projected that I was going to do 10 iterations. So six out of 10, I'm 60% done. Have I got all these different formulations in place and do I have my experimental design done? Well, you can go in and just arbitrarily say, here's where I'm at. You can also start to apply different measures along the way to say, what does it mean? Every project and every problem and every task within that project has a different point of measure. And you do have to use some broad-based experience, some common sense. Sometimes it's regulatory, and sometimes it's industry standards. So, for example, if you are making, um, I don't know, maybe you're making tomato sauce, and you need to make sure that that tomato sauce is compliant within the regulations and the industry standards in terms of the pH values, the mold count, the coloration, the texture, the particle size passing through different sieves, you have all sorts of different measures against which you could be framing this. A lot of it comes from common sense and focus. 
Remember focus from um, Goldratt's theory of constraints. Remember, problem solving is your specialty, innovation is your middle name, and common sense rules the day. So when you are going out there and evaluating where am I at in terms of progress, use common sense first and foremost. What do I really need to be measuring to know that I have done this and done it properly? In some cases it is, I had met that endpoint and I had handed off this to the next stakeholder. And in other cases, you know progress by knowing that you've met the quality standards and so on. Now, I did mention DMAIC. DMAIC is going to be our next theme that we talk about in this class. And there is overlap with project management and operations management. DMAIC is a tool within Six Sigma, and we will have a different discussion about Six Sigma. But the idea being, when you're doing that task, you in, in some cases, you want to define what it is, you want to measure what it is, you analyze it, improve it, and control it. And this, this also has some parallels with the Deming cycle, where we're doing plan, uh, plan, do, study, act, where we're doing that cycle and moving forward in a means where we're getting feedback and we are consistently improving the process. In project management, you do want to go and have that feedback loop, not just on your product, but on your process as well to make sure that you are, you are progressing effectively in your project and moving towards successful outcome. We will be talking about the seven tools, but in many cases, when doing project development, or uh, product development, pardon me, I'm too many product and projects, um, you will want to set different tools to know that you have met your outcome successfully. And some of these tools are the same as what is used in operations management. Moving into our next module in this course, we will be going through each of these tools individually. So we've got stratification, scatter diagrams, parameter diagrams, histograms, control charts, check sheets, and cause and effect analysis. Each of these is one of the seven quality control tools. They can be overlaid in projects to know that the product that you are trying to develop is meeting the quality standard that you're after. They're more commonly used in um, operations to know that the product that you're manufacturing on a routine basis is meeting the quality standards that you're after. But the key out come being we are measuring quality and we are identifying where are the opportunities to improve on quality and when you start to assimilate these tools you'll you'll find that in many cases they're quite intuitive and they allow you to hone in on what the core problem is quite quickly so that you can again use that problem solving mindset theory of constraints hone in on the problem fix it as fast as possible so that you can move on and be as efficient and fast as possible. Now, we mentioned about Scrum and Agile, and these are techniques for doing those feedback cycles that are commonly used. They were, they were originally developed for the software engineering industry, but more and more they're being adapted to a wide variety of different organizations. So in the case of Scrum, Let's first talk about the team. You usually have a Scrum Master and a Product Owner and then a development team. The Scrum Master oftentimes is that manager and the Product Owner is the person who is going to be taking the final approval on saying this is the product that I want and I'm going to move forward. It could be in some cases the, the client that is contracting services. If, if you're in a product development team and you're working in partnership with a retailer, they could say, um, let's say you're a private label manufacturer and you're making a frozen dinner for Loblaws. Loblaws could be the product owner and they could have their own team defining. And then you've got a development team. So first and foremost, you've got that plan in place where you've got an identification of all the different tasks that you need to do. Then you're going to have a daily scrum. So this is a, a daily session where you walk through and you say to your development team, where are we at? What tasks are urgent? Are there any um, backlog tasks that really need to be prioritized today so that we get this project out the door as fast as possible? You go ahead and do your stuff. 
you do a review and you then go back and redefine that plan on an almost daily basis to see which tasks are progressing quickly, which tasks need subordination so that we put more resources on it, which tasks are causing a lot of problems and perhaps need additional research. But the idea being on a daily basis to get that feedback loop in, in progress so that you make sure that the task is being completed on time. Now, there are parallels between Scrum, and you will often hear about another uh, technique that is commonly um, interplayed in here, and that's called Kanban. Kanban is a Japanese technique, and it, it derived from manufacturing, but the idea being to visualize the process. And so Kanban often uses a board system. Oftentimes, this is a whiteboard in a team room setting, and it will list out the different tasks that need to be done, usually in the requested column. Here's where you're going to list out all of the subtasks that need to be done at any given time to get that, uh, get that project done. You'll have an in-progress column, and that in-progress column, you'll notice there's a number at the top, and that often relates to how many resources you have available to you. So that could be how many people or how many hours in the day. But there's what's called a work in progress limit. You can only move so many tasks over at any given time. And so in this case, in this board, you can only move three tasks over. And those tasks are represented on cards. And those cards, in some cases, are color-coded. Um, I have another slide moving forward that talks about the color coding, but they can be color coded so that you know who is responsible or what is the priority on those or what part of the project does it belong in. This is, uh, Kanban in many respects is a really great visualization of a to-do list, but it shows all the different tasks. It then shows what tasks are being done in progress. It sets a cap on how many can be done. And then when the tasks are done, they're left up there in the done slot so that you can get a visualization of how much percent-wise are we done on this project. Last but not least, one feature is this expedite or swim lane, as they often call it. Sometimes when you're in a project, we've talked about theory of constraints in a different slideshow, you will have a constraint or a task that comes up that needs prioritization in order to get the project back on track. And so, in some cases, those are going to go to the expedite lane. In other cases, these could be emergencies that are taking people's mind away from the project, but it's going to take away from the work in progress capabilities. And so you can only have three in this column if three is that number. Again, that number is arbitrary based off of the size of your team and the capabilities of that team. But in this case, you can only have three in that column. If there were three emergencies that came up, you could only deal with expedite emergencies or swim lane emergencies. So again, Kanban as a, as a system is a really nice visualization. And oftentimes there's a, there's a, there are entire courses that you can take online for learning Kanban and Scrum and to become a, a Kanban master or a Scrum master. Something that I really want to reinforce is that there's not a hard and fast rule. The main the main hard and fast rule is that there is organization and deliberateness behind the tasks that are being done so that you know what tasks need to be done, who is doing what, and that there's accountability. And in this case, in the case of Scrum or in the case of Kanban, there's accountability through the visual tools and the routines that are done every single time to make sure that projects are done efficiently and effectively. This is a colorization for Kanban cards. So you could be using red for emergencies or expedites. They often say that work in progress, you should only ever have one emergency in process, that uh, you can have fixed delivery where you have to have that, um, if you remember from our theory of constraints, and our CPM mapping, in some cases, a task has to be done on time. Otherwise, everything else is going to fall behind. And so you could, in your Kanban, use uh, a different color coding to say, this one must be done to maintain our critical path. 
And so ideally you don't want to overload how many critical path tasks you have. You want to make sure that you are not overloading it. Two, you, you can have bugs. And in some cases, when you have those scrum sessions where you're meeting on a, on a very frequent basis to identify who is doing what tasks and, and get that feedback loop in, in progress, you can identify bugs and you can reallocate those as bug tasks that need to be corrected as soon as possible. And so in some cases, they'll be in the expedite lane or in other cases, it's through color coding, but you want to be prioritizing those as well. You can have standard tasks and these are going to be along your, along your CPM or your critical path. Those are tasks that need to get done, but there's not that level of urgency that needs to be prioritized to it. Last but not least, in Kanban, you can put in other things like chores or what they call intangibles. These are maintenance tasks. They are subordinated if an emergency comes up. But in many cases, those are absolutely critical to the effective functioning of your organization. So, for example, if you are making food products, you still have to do sanitation, you still have to do requisitioning, you still have to do um, preventative maintenance, you have to do routine inspections of your facility, you have to do training for your employees. You can't forget those other chores that are necessary for the successful mandate of your operation. You can assign them to an appropriate person and make sure that they're done so that you're being ahead on all of those other preventative tasks. So you're at implementation phase. You are working on projects right now. I am hoping that you're using some of these different tools to help you organize your tasks. And again, the whole purpose of this progression of slides is that we want you to have these tools available to you to help make your life easier. I know it seems like a big learning curve right now, but once you've started to assimilate some of these tools, you honestly will have a sense of organization that makes your life easier as you're doing projects. I always love talking with you. Uh, feel free to send me questions or send me topics that you'd like to cover in these slideshows. I enjoy your questions very much and I really love it when people call me on the phone or send me an email and say, hey, what did you mean by this in the video? It's fantastic. Do reach out anytime and we hope to hear from you soon. Take care.